fabulous friend and brother, Ronnie Landis, who is joining us from Texas. I'm so grateful. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Ronnie in a minute because I want everybody to hear about this amazing being. So while we're waiting for some folks to start streaming into our loving room, um, I wanna tell you about Rhythmia and what's going on here. We are open, we've been open since November. We are having amazing retreats every week. Call the number right there, <laughs> call that number and, uh, and talk to our, our amazing call center who can help you book your stay. We are so safe. Um, I think we're the only resort of any kind uh, that I know of that actually tests people before they come on property. So it's easy to fly to Costa Rica. There's no PCR test required to get into the country. You arrive, we bring you to Rhythmia and we give you a, a test here on property because we're a medically licensed facility and we have a lab and doctors all here. So we test you. So everyone that's on property has been tested negative before they get here. And then we do follow up temperature checks, run all, all, all guests twice a day throughout your stay. And we test our staff three times a day, temperature checks and regular testing for the staff as well. And then we have a closed campus. It's a limited, uh, limited access campus, which means that we don't let a lot of people in and a lot of people out. Um, you can check in, but you can't check out. But actually the truth is nobody ever checks out arrhythmia because the same person that checked in isn't the same person that checks out. You leave that old carcass behind as you rise up on the rock, baby. So, so come check us out. And then when you have to get back into the States, you need a PCR test to get back. No worries. We do that here. So we got it all handled for you. The easiest, safest international travel you'll have a transformational vacation. So all that said, to be able to welcome my brother, Ronnie Landis, let me tell you about this amazing being. Ronnie is a leading expert in holistic health, natural nutrition, and human potential. Um, he powerfully supports driven entrepreneurs, athletes, performers, executives, influencers to perform at their best mentally, emotionally, and physically. He explores the fringes of cutting edge health, science, food-based nutrition. He combines self-mastery training, um, supplementation strategies, and a deep passion for helping others overcome long held mental and emotional roadblocks so they can experience every area of their life at their full potential. That sounds great. I'm in. Ronnie is a public speaker, teacher, published author of multiple books. You see all those books behind him? He's an amazing author uh, and a holistic performance coach. And above all else, a man who has devoted his life to uplifting humanity to its next level. Woo! That's a beautiful thing, Ronnie. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ronnie Landis. Hey, Ronnie. Thanks so much, brother. Man, so good to be here with you. What an honor. It's really great to have you. I, you know, one of the first things that I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, so much to talk to you about, but I want to let everybody know that um, I met Ronnie, gosh, five years ago? I think so, yeah. We On a, on a trip with Agape to Egypt. Mm -hmm. And that was such an amazing trip, man. Such an amazing trip. And that's where I got to know Ronnie and we had some amazing experiences. There are still things from that trip that that are resonating with me. Mm -hmm. Messages that still uh, resonate. Ronnie, what was? Tell me a little bit about your takeaway from the trip, and what what was resonant for you? Uh, man, what a great way to start the conversation. Yeah, two weeks in Egypt with you, with Michael Beckwith, with Akili Beckwith, Keith Mitchell, Brandy. Um, I mean, so many others. Um, but yeah, I mean, you were one of definitely one of my highlights, just as a just as a brother and getting to connect with you. And you know, there was a lot of uh, there was a lot of challenging spaces I got I entered into, <clears throat> you know, because the energy there is full on. It's no joke. There's serious paranormal energy that I slipped into going through, uh, you know, certain tombs where you know whole history had occurred on this planet. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely had to move through some challenging spaces within myself. But I'd say, um, man, one, one of the takeaways, well, I, I, that's actually an interesting point. Um, boundaries, mm. energetic boundaries was really a big takeaway that I think of now, like actually putting on the armor of God. Right. You know, like when we're going through life, we're going through ancient um ancient energy, if you will. And that's certainly what I experienced there in different times. 
there's both light and dark energy, right? And if we don't have that armor on, we become susceptible to all kinds of things. And there were times where I actually got hit by some kind of energy. And the next day I'm like, I'm not my normal self. I'm laid out. I'm in some kind of weird funk. And I remember being in that funk. And uh, it was like, nobody really wanted to talk to me. And you came over and talked to me. And that was actually really, really helpful. I remember that moment. You were just there as a brother, like, hey, how you doing? You seem a little down. Just want to make sure you're OK. And um, just little things like that meant everything. And wow. um, yeah, I wanted, so I wanted to say that. And aside from that, man, wow, two weeks in Egypt. Um, it, it's hard. I'd have to like really meditate on it because it was like so much had happened. I, I will say this, the, the one thing I did get for sure is uh, you remember where we were on the Nile and we were yes. on the boat and there were all these these uh, these guys coming over on other boats trying to sell us clothes and I was just like this is amazing this is the definition of hustle and grind if they're <laughs> I remember telling Akili I said don't ever let me complain about anything uh. <laughs> <laughs> that was, you know, I'm, as you were talking about the energies, I remember, and I just came across this picture recently. I was looking back to that trip. I wanted to get a picture for a presentation I was doing of, of one of the, the pictures I took in a temple. And I found a picture of you and me in the Holy of Holies uh, uh, next to, was it Hagara? Hoth, Hoth, Hagra? I can't remember, but she was the goddess that was a beautiful woman and also turned into a tiger. And she had the face of a tiger and the body of a woman. And we were in her, the, in her temple at the Holy of Holies. And there's yeah. you and me are standing on either side of the statue. And there's all these orbs. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right? Yeah. Um, and we, I remember so clearly, do you remember that meditation? We, we so yeah. just to bring everybody up to speed, the, the, the theme of this trip was that the Nile is like the spine and that the temples along the Nile were the chakras mm. and the, the pyramids were the crown chakra, right? And we went to, we started in the, the, the big pyramid in the king's chamber with a meditation. And then we flew down to Aswan all the way south at the Sudanese border and we came up the Nile and did chakra you know, activated different chakras with all the temples. So in that meditation in the King's chamber, we yeah. were led on this meditation and Reverend Michael said, you know, you were, you were called back here. Your soul called you back. You left something here. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? What was it that you left? You left a message for yourself in Kemet. And, and what is that message? And he led us on this visual. And then we came to a door on this journey and we were to open the door and the message was to be revealed. Do you remember that? And do you remember what your message was? Uh, that's that's amazing. I remember, here, here's what I remember and it's quite hilarious. It wasn't at the time when all of that was happening, my bladder was filling up like <laughs> business. So we're all <laughs> in this pitch black, <laughs> the Pharaoh's tomb and like Michael, with is is channeling like nobody's because i've never seen him go that hard before and it's like everything is just going on and the whole time i'm sitting there like like breathing because i have to go to the bathroom more like harder than i've ever had to in my life so i i don't remember i don't remember the question i don't remember the answer i just remember like getting through that and then eventually getting outside and and having I my <laughs> and, 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 and and like there's no like restroom in the in the tomb right and and to get there man i'm just remembering how much it took we had to like crawl there were places where we had to get on our knees and go up and down and all the way to get up there so it was a long way out for you to have to go to the bathroom i, I wanted to go really fast but i had to go very slow <laughs> so so your message your message from egypt was go to the bathroom as often as possible <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> There's all those Turkish copies. Um, um, <laughs> the, there was a, well, okay, so I, I won't go, there, there was an old story actually from when I was really like just starting uh, in college. I was like, 
uh, waiting tables uh, and in college. And I was really young and this um, old man came into the restaurant for lunch and he was like 98. And, and, um, and he was so with it, man, at 98, he was hilarious. And he, he kept telling jokes and he was witty. And I was so taken with him. I remember this has to do with going to the bathroom. And, um, and I said to him at the end of the lunch, I was like, sir, you know, I'm like 20 or 19, you know, and I go, sir, you're so buoyant and, and full of life. And, and, uh, you know, I want to know what advice would you give me about life? Like I'm starting on this road that you've already been down. What advice would you give me on your 98th birthday? You know, <laughs> and he goes, go to the bathroom as you know, he goes, never trust a fart and go to the bathroom as often as possible. <laughs> that, was, that was his advice, which is apparently what you got out of Egypt. So that, that um, take away for sure. I remember, I remember, uh, uh, my message was, nothing is being withheld mm, mm, mm. nothing is being withheld before we go further i just want to acknowledge um you know all these mia hello and Kristen and priscilla your son is here beautiful we'll say hello to him joni hello and sala and shelly great to see you again shelly and ellie and jay bladderful and mia and someone's asking but it was pitch black yeah. um yeah the tomb is the it's the king's chamber and it is in the center of the of the temple, there's no windows. It was pitch, pitch black. So, um, so Ronnie, you know, Egypt was a was an amazing time together, and it was a time when we came together. But out of that, you've brought so much into the world. This was just a part of your spiritual growth and development, and you're on that you're on a path of continuous growth and development. It's never done, but I, I'm really interested in knowing your story of germination your story of maturation and that point, you know, how did you get from there to here to this, you know, what is your story of activation? Um, mm -hmm. Would you share that with us? I don't know if that's a clear question or not, but that's it's what I'm absolutely clear and I'll, I'll keep it as, uh, <clears throat> as simple as possible. So, yeah, I mean, I, I've had, I've had a series of milestone moments in terms of like my awakening experience, waking up out of the dream spell of the, the, you know, the 3d materialistic, you know, left brain type of analytical reality, you know, the props and the stages that we all are navigating through and all that. And, um, so I was raised as a martial artist since the age of four and I was actually a, um, international competitor in Taekwondo. I, I ran a martial arts school with, um, multiple hundreds of students and competed full time. I'm take wow. There we go. Um, yeah, it's better. Uh, yeah. So I, you know, that, that was pretty much my life for the first 23 years of my life. That was my all consuming passion. That's what I knew that I was doing with my life. And then, uh, you know, a fork in the road had manifested and, um, I had a series of knee injuries, one when I was 18, one when I was 21 and I had to go through the rehabilitation process and learn. I had to, to learn about nutrition. I had to learn about what a what a uh, a healthy lifestyle looked like because despite all my athletic prowess and all that, um, I, I didn't really live a, a healthy lifestyle aside from exercise and training. I, I wasn't eating healthy. I was eating more of like a processed pet food diet, which is what I equate, you know, the standard American diet. Now it's kind of like a processed pet food type of diet, and that's what I was on. That's that's all I knew growing up. And so I, I, I had to make the connection that my, my physical health and my healing had to do with what I put into my body, right? Mm. That, that, as obvious as that is now, that wasn't obvious to me when I was 18, 19, and 20. And then I eventually landed on YouTube University and studied, I started just studying health and started stumbling on all these videos like raw foods and juicing and, and vegan vegetarianism at the time and getting into, um, you know, all that stuff. And it changed my worldview. It changed my consciousness and it definitely changed my health. And uh, so basically what ended up happening with me is that I, I decided to ask myself a question. I just said, what would happen if I went on a 30 day raw vegan diet? And just what would happen? I have no idea. I'm just like, what, 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 what would happen if I did this experiment? What did happen is that I healed my knee injuries. I healed both of my knees. 
Um, mm -hmm. I, I, and I, had, I had to ice my knees every single day for years. After every workout, I'd ice my knees and, and do the whole thing. I didn't have to ice my knees anymore. All the inflammation started to go from my body. And then I had something happen up here. Mm -hmm. Shifted up here. And I started to realize that not only was I out of pain, but or here's what I'll say about it. Because this is an important point I want to mention. Okay. Um, is this is this is what happened to me, and this was the consciousness shift that I had that led me into what I do now. Um, I, I realized that everybody is walking around with pain, you know, psychological, emotional, um, physical, for sure. People are loaded up on all kinds of, um, whether it's psychiatric or pharmaceutical drugs, trying to medit trying to medicate and manage their pain um, symptoms, um, uh, whatever it is. That everybody has some kind of pain that they're carrying with them. And I didn't realize that before. That wasn't, you know, it was kind of, yes, that's probably true, but I didn't think about that. That wasn't like up in my face. And then it just dawned on me because after those 30 days, I had forgotten that I was ever in pain. I was mm. so accustomed to being in pain or having a, a knee injury. Like I, so there was an identity of who I was based on that. And then I completely forgot about it. I went and ran five miles in the hills. I came back and I was like, wait, whoa, wait a minute. What just happened? I haven't been able to do that for years. Wow. So I forgot about that version of me that was injured or was rehabbing. And then that's when I realized something about healing and transformation, which is like, it's, it's, it's forgetting about who you used to be. It's forgetting about the fact that you were in pain, like forgetting that the pain is even there. And so for me, that was my major transformational moment, if you will. And what happened to my consciousness was I just no longer desired to pursue a life of athletics, still love it. But I, I, something just changed and shifted. I decided I wanted to be an orator. I wanted to be a voice for a message. And all of a sudden, I had a new message. And uh, that started out, you know, getting into the raw food world and getting into superfoods and juicing and cleansing. And, and, and um, over the last 12 years, that's kind of become an integration between psychological, emotional development and then the, the the physical optimization, which is you know the nutrition, the lifestyle, and all those things wrapped up together. But it's really whole human healing um, as a whole. And I and I will say, the Egypt trip and, and all the agape work over all the years, and all the influences into spiritual development, metaphysics, all that, for sure has greatly influenced my perspective on you know, just what I do in the, in the world. It's not just nutrition. It's not just what you put in your mouth. That's a huge, that's probably the biggest lever that somebody can practically do to create the most amount of change. But we have to address what's going on up here. If we do Absolutely. not address this and we don't address this right in here, what's, what's eating at us, what's keeping us up at night, not just taking the melatonin supplement, but actually what's keeping us up. You know what I mean? Yes, uh, and we're not going to be able to heal the the ills that the ills that ail us, and um, that became something that I just became very passionate about because I had to figure out the quandary of my own existential issues, if you will. And that we can, I'll leave it there. I'll leave it on that for now, and you know, we'll see where that goes. I I love what you said that you had to give up this old story. That you, your old identity of being of being in rehab, of rehabbing, and like the the whole ritual, I'm sure of icing the knees. And the, I just heard this story of these two Buddhist monks that needed to get across the river, so they get a canoe, and they get across the river, and then they pull the canoe out of the river, and they they put it over their heads, and now they're walking with the canoe over their heads, and they come. They've been on land now, and they they come with the canoe, and their the master says why are you carrying a canoe over your heads? <laughs> and they said, well, we had to get across the river. He said, well, you already got across the river. Right? And I just love that, right? Like, it's just exactly what you said, right? Like, I don't need that carcass of an old story, an old identity of what I used to need to get myself over, you know? Right, right. that's brilliant.
And so this, this, so, so your, your spiritual awakening started with a physical healing and, and that all happened in 30 days of a vegan raw diet. You, you healed your, your knees in 30 days. Yeah. Yeah. That's, Beautiful. That, yeah. Yeah. And that, that's no longer like my, my, um, 100% diet anymore. It's more integrated and holistic at this point, but that, but that was like 10 years. I rode that wave for 10, 10 years or so and rode it strong. And um, now it's integrated into like a like a whole food um, kind of thing. Whereas there's there's sustainable sourced animal products, plant based products, and I go in between. Um, that's mm -hmm. something we can talk about if it's relevant. Um, but that but that 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 in of itself was also another awakening too. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk about uh, you know your personal. I'm always so interested in knowing what people's daily routine is, uh, mm -hmm. the things that they do physically, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally uh, to keep yourself lifted. Uh, so that would be a great, and I, and I also would love to hear about that awakening as you shifted, because I too made a shift from being vegan to more integrated, mm -hmm. sustainably sourced animal products as well. Um, I call it being a, a, a choice-itarian. <laughs> so, yeah. but I'd love to talk, talk about that. Will you, so will you share with us a little bit about your daily practice and ritual, physical, spiritual, yeah. mental, emotional, and then the awakening you had around shifting from being a vegan to more integrated foods? Sure, sure. Yeah, that's that's brilliant. Um, so this is great because I, I got off a coaching call about an hour ago. And a lot of the work, a lot of the message that I'm sharing in the world, I, I'm, I'm about to release a brand new book called The Addiction-Free Lifestyle. And I and that's a whole that's a whole talk in of itself, and I'm sure we'll we'll touch on that. But one of the things that I was talking about with this client is the the dynamics between masculine and feminine from a from a particle physics perspective, right? So okay. there's you have an unstable force, which is what we would equate as like the feminine. This and by the way, this is not a per, this doesn't mean women are unstable. This is this is a physics perspective. There's an unstable force, then you have a stable force, which is like quote unquote masculine, and the unstable force is always trying to parabond with a stable force to create order so in mm -hmm. other words there's disorder disarray unorganization which means chaos so we just have chaos that's addiction right that's another word for just addiction um having no plan having no roadmap having no structure no no what am i going to do with myself so all that energy just goes wherever it goes right and, and the, the, the thing I was talking to him about is you got to balance these dynamics, right? You got to balance discipline or structure with spontaneity. You got to have both, but you can't just have nothing. You can't leave it up and just have a free for all. And so I, I share that because that's been the biggest thing for me is to actually have structure and order in my life to keep that energy moving in a, in a predictable direction. I can't predict what's going to happen, but I can predict enough to stay stable, to stay, to maintain some kind of coherence um, with my energy to keep it ordered. The way that I do that is pretty simple. Um, when I wake up in the morning, I, I tend to just slowly wake up and uh, take 10 deep diaphragmatic breaths, just right there, just, just to kind of get a sense of, okay, where's the body? How am I feeling in my body? What is there any anxiety? Any and how am I feeling? Am I feeling good? Like what is it? Just and then just prime the body before I jump up and check the phone and get into the whole the whole day. Just check in with my body. How are you feeling today? Do you need anything? You good? Okay, great. And then nice. from there, and then from there, hydration is critical. I, I've been preaching this for at least ten years. Like spring water, hydration. Um, so I drink about one liter of water every single morning, with a few like supplements and things, and that's how I get into my day. And um, you know, from there, I do like a green juice or one of these um, green powdered superfood, um, you know, shakes. Um, something like that to alkalize the body, get my body nutrified and nourished and start getting into the day. And then I have a workout. So I'm really, I'm really big into fitness. That's one of my things. And that's how I like to, to put myself up against voluntary resistance in the day. I feel like if we don't do that for ourselves, then life will give us things to resist against. And, um, I prefer to minimize that as much as possible. Um, preferably. So I create my own resistance that I can put myself up against 
to, to match against and to grow and challenge myself. So I feel good about myself in the day. I did something that was hard. Um, I didn't take the easy way out and I, I, um, and I feel good about myself. That's the, that's the way I want to start my day. Can I stop you right there? Cause, cause this is really interesting to me. Uh, and I, I so agree with you. So you're saying that the physical movement, has a psychological oh, for connection sure. in, in the sense, like the insights that you receive from the resistance uh, that you feel to, to not want to go someplace where you're uncomfortable, whether it's a position or a handstand or- Or even off. getting up to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. Just that, just a little, oh no, I'd rather just, it's comfortable here and no, just relax and just lay in bed, no. No, I'm not. I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to gain anything from that. But but those thoughts come up, and sometimes I'm tired. Sometimes I didn't get as much sleep as I might have wanted to, so I'm more susceptible. I'm actually. It's entirely psychological. <clears throat> I think it's entirely psychological. Um, the physical side is just the benefit, you know, like getting muscles and whatever. That's cool. That's the benefit. But it's actually keep going, keep going keep going until I get to that point where I feel like, okay, I just, I did it. I'm, I'm happy. I'm ready to go to the next part of my day. Beautiful. So it's checking with the body, breathing in the morning, hydrating, alkalining the body, then moving the body, finding the places of resistance. Mm. And that, that out pictures in the rest of your day that you've, you've already overcome some resistance right. you've already you've That's already right. challenged yourself you've already gone to those places and it kind of primes the pump for the mm -hmm. rest of your day that's right yeah and if, if nothing else gets done in the day for whatever reason the workout is an accomplishment right like it, it, there's still something that i accomplished i did something i overcame something i can feel good about that um i but more more than not that actually carries me into the rest of the day um you know, to, to be able to achieve whatever it is I'm trying to do. So awesome. I, I agree with you. I, I've been working on a handstand for a while now. <laughs> I still can't do a handstand, but I mean, I can, uh, I'm still working on it, but that just that mm. has been like, Oh, when I'm up there and I think I'm going to fall, how reactive am I? Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. could I just take a breath and get a little bit more while I'm up there? Mm -hmm. What if I did that in life? Like I've seen, I've had so many insights just around pushing myself into the uncomfortable areas. Mm -hmm. uh, like you said, right. Just around a handstand, you know, it's been, it's been my, one of my greatest teachers. It's amazing. So, so um, let's see, there was something else that you said. Oh, well, all right. So now after talking about your daily routine, you were going to talk about your, uh, awakening around moving yeah. from veganism to a more integrated. That's right. Uh, yeah. And I'll, I'll try to keep this as short as possible, but it is definitely a story worth telling, especially for everyone out there that is considering maybe you're on the vegan, the vegan path right now. I was, I was on that for the better part of 10 or 11 years. I've written multiple books that were tied to that. I've given hundreds, literally hundreds of lectures on raw foods and superfoods and herbalism and cleansing, detoxing, healing, the whole gamut. I was in the raw food, um, superfood speaking circuit and, and all the whole thing. So I'm just, I say that to let you know that I could argue that argument better than m most people on that argue against it. I just want to make that point. Um, so I did for a long time and I was thriving for a long time until I wasn't. And uh, it wasn't obvious to me. It was kind of slow decline of just um, even a little bit mental faculties, just bodily energy, um, virility, uh, you know, just just like kind of life force energy. It kind of it basically reached like a glass ceiling. I just kind of hit after about seven, seven, eight years. I kind of hit this point where I realized that, you know, if I stay here, nothing's going to really get better from here. Like I'm not going to be able to go beyond this point. I'm better than most people from a health and fitness and just, you know, performance perspective, but I'm not nearly where I want to be. And so ultimately what happened for me, and this was a year ago, this was about 13 months ago, actually, when 
I decided to incorporate um, meat back into my diet after 10 or 11 years. And um, I, my body basically just told me, it was, I can't explain it, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I remember my body just told me, it's time to make a change. And I'll be, I had my identity pretty pretty anchored into that community and, and who I was, and or at least who I thought people thought of me, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there was that component, but my body would just told me like, hey, it's time to make a change. You, you need to actually take some medicine from the animal world to rebuild yourself. And so I reluctantly decided to do that. And it wasn't like I wanted to do it. I didn't even want it to work. Like I kind of did because I wanted to feel really good again, but there was a part of me that didn't want it to work, you know, because there was still the identity of who I used to be or who I thought people wanted me to be. And uh, here's basically what happened. So I sit down at the table with my partner at the time. There's a, there's a steak in front of me. And I'm sitting there talking to myself like, okay, like, are you really going to do this? Are we really doing this? Is this really? And, and then I just, I start taking a few bites and here's what happened to me. Immediately a, a, a rush of blood flow starts coursing through my arms. Like literally my red blood cells are getting activated. They're getting like charged. And I'm actually like, whoa, it was like a niacin flush basically. Like right. throughout my arms, all up into my head. And then it was like I had a brain gasm. Like my brain starts vibrating. Oh. And I I I I mean it, it like I'm just thinking about the experience right now and I'm just pausing on it because it was such an intense physiological response, but it felt so good. Like yeah. my Basically, like my body was upgrading itself, the whole operating system, as I call it, the nervous system was upgrading itself within a moment of doing this. And that was the moment I realized, oh, here's the other thing that happened, and I think this is helpful for the everyone listening too. This is basically what happened, and it was the most liberating thing that, that had ever happened to me. The box that my psyche was in, uh -huh. it was actually as if the box fell apart and, and fell away like the dogma, the identity, the ideology, the belief system, it actually fell off and my, my, the scale from my eyes fell off. And all of a sudden I was able to see reality like an HD vision. Like so, the, way, the way that your camera is versus mine. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I was able to see reality. And, and by the way, I, I, I didn't want this to work. This was not what I wanted, but it, right. it did work, and I had to actually humble myself. This was one of the most humbling things that I've done in many, many years because I realized that my preconceptions, the, the vegan dogmatic preconceptions that I held before were actually false. It, it wasn't true. Um, yeah. Well, okay, really quickly, I'm Venna from Kodiak Island, I'm saying hello, and uh, and. My, Lisa, Lisa and Max are always saying hi from the Poconos. I just wanted to shout out to them. Mia asks you, because I, well, before I get to Mia's question, you know, I was vegan too, not for 10 years, but I was vegan for a good amount of time. And I, I do notice when I go through like vegan fasts, like I'll still do that for Lent or Ramadan, you know, I'll, it'll be like a, 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 an abstinence of some sort as part of a devotional period. And I do notice a difference, but I, I go back to now like you, right? And I remember making that switch um, and what a big, like it, there was so much involved in that. Cause you know, for so many years, my family, I'm Lebanese, right? So it really was like my big fat Greek wedding where they're like, you don't eat meat. You don't, don't worry, we'll make lamb. You know, like, <laughs> oh, how about chicken? Like, no, I don't eat meat. Like, okay, fish? No, there's no, right? Like, they, people just don't get it. Like, meat's red, red meat, cow. But, um, and, and they would, like, make special rice for me with the special, you know, vegan butter, earth balance, and, you know, all this stuff. I'd have, like, separate stuff when i go to family. So it was a big identity around that. And then for them, they were all like, oh, so great. You finally realized how wrong you were, you know, all of that, right? So I, I totally identify with you on giving up that identity. Um, and, and so Mia's saying, uh, 
or did you, I don't know if you saw our question. What do you yeah. say to those people who, who say you can't ascend while eating meat? Okay, well, that's, that's a great question. And um, I don't really buy into the whole ascension thing anymore. That's part of what uh, all my preconceptions around spiritual concepts, belief systems, um, which I just call software programs at this point, um, I, they, they all actually went out the door. Now that doesn't mean there aren't principles that are tried and true, but the, but the belief programs or the storylines wrapped around the, like the Ascension story, like this is what you need to do to ascend and where are we ascending anyways? Like, um, I, I personally think we need to focus on incension, like mm. incension into the physical body and getting really comfortable being anchored in our physicality because I think a lot of the, the the spiritual community is all about transcending the body, which even Siddhartha, i.e. Buddha, realized was not the way. He punished himself and deprived himself almost to kill himself until he realized like, oh, wait a minute, this I'm still not free of my suffering. I still haven't solved this problem. Yes. And it was until he accepted himself and his body that he was able to reach that kind of bodhisattva um, you know, embodiment. So I think actually what we need to do is, is embody and really get really like into our body, not from a narcissistic position, but from not an ego place, but a physical place, like actually getting in tune with our physical body. And what does this body really require outside of stories, outside of ideal ideology, outside of other people's opinion, because your body, my body, is unique and, and my needs are going to trump my belief system. Like I can have a really good belief about something, but my biology is going to override my belief if it's not in alignment, right? If it doesn't match the reality and that's what happened to me and that's, that's what's happened to so many of my friends who were on the vegan path for a long, long time and then they had similar experiences. So. You know, I think we have to get clear about what what that idea of ascending even means, and is that even a real thing? Is that even something we need to focus on? Um, I don't know. That that's not my position, but I, I I think if if you're doing something that actually is harming you long term, then is that a path to ascension? I don't think so. So I think you know it, it's 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 about thriving. It's about doing what what's going to help you achieve your goal. Um, and if your goal is to thrive and to optimize and to have vital life force energy in your body and then to be able to direct that life force in a way that's beneficial to other people and to the planet and to yourself and your family and your community, then anything that you're consuming that actually allows for that is a positive transmutation of energy. Mm. Okay. So... You know, just to, to kind of flesh this out a little bit, excuse the pun, um, <laughs> uh, you know, there is a philosophical belief, right? So there, we're talking about the physical belief and, and the body and tuning the body. And I love what you said about um, uh, uh, about anchoring in the body. I was just listening to Thich Nhat Hanh talking about, um, you know, he, somebody asked him a question about not being uncomfortable. What, 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 what happens when the present moment is uncomfortable? And he said, well, there's two things that can happen when you return home to the present moment is you either find bliss and joy or you find something uncomfortable. And, and we're not asking, he's not asking you to endorse the discomfort, but to be present to what it is that's causing you discomfort. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of this either way is an, is an anchor coming back here in the body right now in the present moment because that's the access point to the eternal now mm -hmm. and it's full acceptance right so this is sort of part of that right. uh what you're talking about but you are also um you know there's a there's a long-standing philosophical belief of compassion mm -hmm. right for for life and doing no harm mm -hmm. so i'd love to know because and i know that that's your interest yeah. right you want to yeah, be a, you're supporting right. life so how do you square eating meat or animal products, even if they're sustainably yep. so resourced, et cetera, with this idea of compassion and uh, not doing harm. 
Okay, so there, I could actually go really long on that question. I've given this years of thought, years and years of thought. I've written extensively in, in my books and podcasts and things, so I'm, I won't go into the long answer because there's actually a lot of, there's a lot built into that answer. Let's talk about the Ahimsa principle from the, from the Vedic yogic system, right? Because that's where the Hindu system is really where the whole idea of vegetarianism comes from especially from kind of the spiritual um, communities. They're very rooted in the, the kind of Ayurvedic and yogic principles. So let's talk about the Ahimsa. Do no harm to others, right? Okay. Now, that, there's two parts to the Ahimsa. There's two parts to this whole compassion story. But that phrase that I just said is what most people, most people know. Do no harm to others. But here's the second. Here's the follow-up phrase to that. Do no harm to yourself. Mm. Do no harm to others and do no harm to thyself. That's the complete phrase of, of that teaching. And so that becomes the quandary. That becomes the, the paradox or it becomes the, the whatever, the integration where, okay, what I'm doing for others or the planet or what I perceive to be as a benefit to the planet, i.e. I'm eating a particular way, that supports the environment, it supports sentient life, all that, does it support me? And for me, the answer was yes, for a period of time it did, until it didn't. And to keep doing that and to keep pushing that once I became aware of it would be, it, it would not be appropriate. Um, and then there's a lot of questions as to, you know, um, uh, agricultural methods, you know, like conventional farming of, of fruits and vegetables, and how much how much harm does that actually do to the environment and to um, you know all the animals that have to be either killed or taken off their land? And and there's a holistic picture to all this. We we live in cities. We're domesticated, right? We come from city environments, detached from nature itself. So we get like a picture of a, a cow on a milk carton, and we're like, oh, that's a farm, right? But <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know you, once you actually go to farms and you talk to farmers and you understand that there's a difference between conventional big agri agriculture and, and chemical based agriculture and factory farming, by the way, which is a which is an atrocity. It should never have happened. It should. It's it's the worst thing ever by far. It's like it's like it's yes. like cost nutrition. So so let's just make that distinction very clear. When it comes to factory farming and caged farming and in the abuse of animals, that is absolutely um, inexcusable by any measure. And that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is responsible agriculture, um, biodynamic agriculture and animal husbandry, which is humans and animals who actually work together and animals that are domesticated that if put into the wild would actually you know, actually have a much worse fate, you know, due to predation, due to predators in the wild. Remember, the wild has predators that, you know, that their fate would be very, very, um, it'd be, it'd be, you know, whatever word you want to label it. it, it would be the natural order of things. So these animals actually have an incredibly good life. And then at the end of the life cycle, there is a transition and it's done as, as smoothly as possible. So whatever your thoughts around that are, that that's kind of my perspective and how I reconcile all that. Um, and, and that's the thing too, right, about life. It's like you can't have it one way. You know, that's one thing I've learned as I've just kind of matured as a human being. I, I can't have things one way. It's not like a one seasonal reality where it's always sunny, like in Southern California. Like there is a there are seasons and cycles. There is a down and there is an up. There's a light and there is a dark. There is a pain and there is a joy. And um, and we're born and we will transition too. So that's, yeah, that's my kind of philosophical uh, two cents. Well, you know, and I, I just, I so appreciate what you said. And I think too of, of our Native American and indigenous peoples uh, who were so connected with, the land and with the animals and they realize that there is an exchange there's an energetic exchange uh and they would they would honor that exchange i yeah. traveled in peru with a beautiful man from the kogi tribe mamo alejandro and and they consider themselves the big brothers of pachamama mm. and um everywhere we went we would be 
uh, walking or we come to a new place, mm -hmm. a new valley, a new town, it didn't matter whether it was in nature or more urban, um, he would find, he would see something and that would be a sign, a rock that looked like a frog or a, a tree or something that reminded him of, of, of something sacred. And we'd stop and he would say, we'd have to make a pago. We'd have to make a payment because mm. we had to balance the energy. Mm. We're, we're taking the resources from this land. We're using the water. We're using the, the food. We're using the resources of this area. And we have to ask the ancestors of this area mm. that what can we, will you grant us this? And then we have to give them something in exchange. And, and sometimes it would, if we didn't have something to leave, he would, he would urinate. Right, like they're just leaving something yeah, in yeah. a prayerful and and conscious manner to balance the exchange, and so I, I think that also around. Uh, oh, yeah. You just brought something up that I think would just kind of help balance this too, um, because I did have this feeling before I ran this experiment. By the way, it's all just an experiment. You're just running an experiment to see what feels right. Just you mm -hmm. know. Yes, no, good or bad, whatever, just running an experiment to see what works, what doesn't. Um, before considering this, I always had the thought that if I was going to eat meat, I'd have to be willing to kill it myself. I don't, I don't want to be detached from that process. Like that's a deeply emotional, that's a the deeply responsible process to take a life and then go through that, that process of preparing it. Um, and I, I, I felt like, no, I don't think I can do that. I mean, if I had to do it, I, I could, but just like to go out there and do it, I, I just, I, I don't think I, I, I don't think I could. And, um, you know, just meditating on that, um, one thought did come to mind, which is that if I'm not going to put this energy into my, my dharma, into my dreams, into my goals, like if I'm not going to actually use this energy for something good, then I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't, I shouldn't consume that meat, but, but mm. because it is energy, it's life force energy. Like I, I had a shamanic experience in that when I had that steak, um, this continued for a couple of days, this whole, like this whole, like physiological upgrade. I actually had a moment where I could feel, I closed my eyes and I could feel the, the animal. I could actually feel the animal that I was consuming and it mm. was, felt as if it was transferring its life force into my body. Like, it's like, here, take wow. my soul. And I had heard people talk about this, but you know, when I was on the other swing of things, I was like, no, whatever. You're just saying that because you know, it's, it's a, you're just, you're just validating eating meat. I had the experience and I've done a lot of plant medicine as well. And I, and so I was, no, I was like, okay, wow, this is, this, this is a shamanic experience I'm having right now with this eating this, you know, this, this, um, this, uh, meat here. And, um, so that all that kind of laid into this, this deeper reverence. I actually have more reverence and feel more connected to animals than I did when I was trying to avoid that whole part of, uh, you know, our, our kind of food agricultural system. You know, I think that, that, uh, first of all, one of the things that came up for me while you're talking is to be very clear with everyone. You said, this is an experiment, right? So there's right. no normative statement. There's no, you should eat meat or you shouldn't eat meat. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. Nobody's right. recommending, right? Uh, I'm saying that to the audience. So this is just Ronnie's experiment and my experiment and encourage you to you for you to experiment and to see what works for you, right? It's like, try it, try whatever it is that you're inquiring in. And the second piece is, um, this truth, I think, in everything that we do, mm. that it's less important what we do as what we think about it while we're doing it. Like it's That's more important the thoughts and energy that we're putting into it while we're doing it. Uh, um, and I just think that's, you know, is bringing this, I mean, I've never experienced feeling that transfer of energy, but I haven't ever thought of that. Mm. And, and so now I'm going to bring that awareness. So can I bring some more reverence? I mean, I pray before every meal. Uh, and sometimes I start eating before praying and then I, I stop and I go, thank you for the food I just ate. <laughs> but it's so important to bring that awareness. It's just about awareness. So you brought such a beautiful story forth, Ronnie. Thank you um, to bring that awareness of 
this is an energetic exchange, whether it's the vegetables uh, and 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 the 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 or, or whether it's a, a, an animal product, right? Whatever it is, we're, consciousness to it. That's one yes. thing for sure. These are all like plants, veg, fruits, vegetables, like the plant kingdom, the fungi kingdom. It's it's living too. Like yes. it's just rooted in the ground, so it's not exactly sentient from the. It's not mobile. It can't really get up and move around. But it is con. There is consciousness associated to it. There's all those great experiments done by um in the cleve baxter books do you remember that the secret life of plants have you ever heard of oh that? yeah 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 there was all those experiments done with the lie detector on the plant and to gauge like how it would react um upon like the threat of being like burned and then when the when the dude actually thought about burning the plant the whole thing went off the scale and it's right. the psychic communication between the person and the plant. So, so I mean, then that puts that then that puts all of us in a bit of a quandary here, where I, th I think we have to become uh, breatharians. If if you yeah, if, I mean, if you want to go down that road, but here's here's where I go with it, JJ. Like my whole feeling around it is that we have to get out of the judgment, mm. like right, wrong, yes, no, because all that's just ego constructs of BS belief systems that are actually pigeonholing our, our human experience. So if we're going to talk about um, uh, the one woman Mia brought up ascension, we're not going to ascend anywhere if we're still boxed in with these dualistic, yes, no, binary, yes, you know, slave programs that are based in judgment. Um, we have to break out of that. And if you have to eat a piece of meat, to, I had to do that. It broke me out of it. If you have to go the other direction or do plant medicines or or go in 10-day Vipassana or get out of that toxic relationship that you've been in for 10 years, whatever the thing is for you that's going to break the shackles of the judgment, um, you know, uh, I just call it the slave program at this point. Whatever's going to help you break out of that, that's the thing that's going to help us ascend. It's not Absolutely. for everyone. It's unique to the individual. I, you know, we're wrapping up our time. We're coming up on the hour and I'm so bummed. We didn't even get to talk about, about all this. <laughs> I know. It was just great. What a beautiful conversation. Everybody seems to be really enjoying it as well. The comments. Um, uh, but I, I so agree with what you just said that the key is our, is the judgment and self uh, self recrimination. I had a lady come out of ceremony here one, one day. It's one of the most amazing things I've ever heard. She came out of ceremony, uh, in the next morning and she goes, John, I've got it. Freedom is observation without judgment. And I oh. went, Whoa, that's brilliant. <laughs> Freedom is observation without judgment. That's uh, brother, mm -hmm. Ronnie Landis. What a joy uh, connecting with you, man, and, and uh, getting to talk to you and, and hearing your beautiful wisdom and insights. Thank you so much for the generosity of your time. My, dude, my absolute pleasure. So good to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, Jerry's doing his uh, messages from the medicine tomorrow at, uh, is it at nine o'clock? Let's see, eight o'clock Pacific time, I think. It's tomorrow. Tomorrow is Jerry. I'll be back on Thursday with Walking the Path. Um, and uh, so grateful that you all are here. Come check us out at Rhythmia. Check Ronnie Landis out. Where can we find information about you, Ronnie? Sure. Um, my website is hhphealth.com. It's like high or holistic high performance health, hhphealth.com. And then um, Instagram, Instagram or Facebook. Um, Ronnie Landis. Those are the easiest places to find me. I also have a podcast with almost 300 episodes over the last six years. So I go into this in a whole lot more, you know, um, in depth. And uh, you could just look up Ronnie Landis on iTunes or just look or just find me on social media. And uh, that's it. Beautiful. Ronnie, thank you. Everybody, Agape and Rhythmia families, thank you so much. And uh, wishing you so much, just an abundance of all manner, an abundance of all manner, an abundance of peace of mind, of health of body, and all needs met. And so yeah. it is. All right. So